Good afternoon and welcome. Thanks to everybody for uh, for joining us here in this uh, last 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 panel. Um, our overarching theme for the um, for the symposium this year, as you've seen, is uh, is clean energy frontiers from lab to market. And and here for the closing, we wanted to think about the market of the future and talk about. Uh, opportunities for um, for research to be done in the lab today so that all, all of you who uh, who remain for this session hopefully you'll you'll leave with uh, with a, with a new idea that you'll take back to the lab and uh, and we'll, we'll complete the complete the loop that way I'm I'm pleased to be joined by uh, by three individuals um, Ask them actually to, to talk briefly about their roles and responsibilities. I think it'd be better if it if it came from you. Um, so just I'm going to say quickly. This is Chris Chris Gorman from National Grid, uh, Chioki Harris from uh, from DOE. You heard heard from him at uh, at lunch. Ian Shapiro from uh, from Tatum Engineering. Let me just say a, a little bit about. So what is National Grid? Okay, so National Grid. We're the investor-owned uh, utility that is the electric and gas provider, um, wires and pipes here in upstate New York. You may know us by Niagara Mohawk. And um, we divested from our generation several years ago. Um, when I first joined the company, energy prices, electricity were increasing 10 to 15% per year. And it wasn't sustainable, so customers wanted lower prices. Um, but instead they said we wanted competition. So they got competition and now we all get phone calls at six o'clock at night trying to get people to, to switch their energy providers. So we simply deliver the energy from point A to point B on behalf of customers. Okay, I uh, can talk about the perspective of, of DOE. So what's the DOE's role here in the, in the market? So DOE has a couple of different functions. Um, one big one is kind of uh, convening and being sort of a conduit for communication between customers in various market segments and the entities, the companies that provide services to them. So that happens kind of across uh, various sectors. That's true in production of fuels and energy, and it's also true in consumption as well, where we work with uh, residential, commercial, manufacturing, industrial partners um, and make sure that their sort of energy needs um, and their major pain points are reflected in the scope of research and development that's happening uh, that we're supporting or that other agencies are supporting. Ian's the founder of a firm called Tatum Engineering. Ian, talk a little bit about what, what services and customers Tatum supports. So we're uh, based in uh, Ithaca, although we started in Syracuse uh, just 25 years ago. Uh, we're a consulting firm and uh, cover anything related to energy and buildings. So we design buildings, we do mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and structural design, mainly for high performance buildings. Uh, we do energy audits and we provide a variety of other support to NYSERDA and to uh, utilities. Uh, and we uh, do applied energy research. We typically have one or two NYSERDA projects or COE projects at any one time. We do some training, energy code training, and then uh, boldly about uh, four years ago we rolled out a couple of specialty contracting services. So now we are uh, solar PV installers. We have two full-time crews and we uh, are uh, aero seal dealers. We seal duct work. Um, typically in high-rise uh, buildings down in Manhattan we send a crew down for a week at a time and we inject an aerosol uh, this was a uh, fantastic uh, lab to market story from uh, Lawrence Berkeley Labs. It's a, it's a uh, fabulous development that uh, seals duct work. So we decided to be bold and tiptoe out of engineering and uh, so far have not done any major damage to buildings. So, so I'm, I'm going to ask a few questions and then we're going to open the floor uh, to, uh, to your questions. You see we've got these three, three different perspectives of, uh, of the market and, and opportunities. Uh, but I'm going to start with this first, first kind of question that um, I'm re reminded that, uh, that the film um, Back to the Future 2 uh, actually just ce celebrated this moment on uh, October 21st. 
uh, in that it was set on October, it was set in 1985, and, and they went forward 30 years to October 21st, 2015. And there were these visions of the future, 30, 30 years in, in the future with uh, you know, skateboards that hovered without wheels and, uh, and other things. So let, let's imagine 30 years from now what the market looks like in each of your sectors. And, uh, and look back 30 years to 2015. So what are, what are the things that need to be done in the lab to get to the future market? So what's the market like in, in 2045? And wow. what, what needs to be done today? I'm happy to take a shot. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, coming, coming from a perspective of working in buildings um, and speaking to an audience that, that, that has uh, university people and uh, government uh, researchers, I, I want to say unequivocally the opportunities for applied energy research are endless. Um, they, there, there are so many areas in which we have needs, it's, it's, it's almost overwhelming. But uh, 30 years into the future, I had made some notes. Um, to ret retrofit a building um, might take a few days, uh, where we roll up to a building and a crew jumps out and does an energy audit within a couple hours and immediately moves into implementation. Uh, that is just far faster and more affordable than today. Today the process is the energy audit takes two or three months. The um, um, scoping out the work, deciding what we're going to do, prioritizing, uh, lining up financing, takes another six months to a year. And then implementing, making physical changes to the building can easily take another six months to a year. And evaluating the results is another year. So I see these projects coming through our office that take three, four years. And I dream of the day where we roll a crew up to a building, evaluate it, uh, make decisions, prioritize, the financing is there and we improve the building and we leave it like we've uh, washed the windows or something. <laughs> um, and uh, we've reduced its energy use from 100% to 20% to within the range of renewables. And we've slapped solar on the roof or we've plugged them into some remote net metered solar and we've eliminated their carbon footprint. Yeah. Chris? Hi, I'm, I'm going to go back to the first. Um, I remember about 25 years ago when I was in Buffalo, I heard the CEO, I believe, of National Fuel Gas, who is the, the natural gas utility out west. And he puts a slide up of transmission towers, electric transmission towers, and said, all of these are going to go away. <laughs> and you know, that was, that was his goal. It was the whole crux of his, his talk at, at an event like this. And you know, here we are 25 years later, and you know, not only are they still standing, not a heck of a lot has changed. Um, I would like to see a system where there is a lot more distributed generation and we know how to integrate it in. A lot of people have said that the way the utility infrastructure is today is, is very similar to what it was with Edison. You generate the power in a central station, it's designed to go in one direction down into people's homes. We're still struggling with how do we move that generation source out into the community and integrate it and how does it all talk well together. Um, so we need to make progress on that. And, Rev and your prize are the start of that. So was the vision 25 years ago with the, the transmission towers would be gone, that uh, generation would be distributed? That yes. was part, part of the vision. There, there was the big vision, him being a natural gas, that you would make electricity in your own homes. And so we'll, 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 we'll have the pipes, but we won't need the transmission. Of course, he wanted to keep his pipes. <laughs> 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 so, yes. Mm. So uh, 30 years ago, if you wanted to watch a movie at home, you would go to Blockbuster, you'd get a VHS tape, and you would take it home, and you would put it in your VCR, you'd watch your video, uh, then you'd have to rewind it, be kind of wild, <laughs> yes. and you'd take it back to Blockbuster. And now, you sit at home in bed with your iPad, and you bring up something on Netflix, and maybe something else, and something else, and something else, until it's 1 AM, and then you go, oh no, I really need to go. <laughs> uh, or maybe that's just me. So um, 
I think that we will see some of those same technologies and capabilities applied to energy use. So actually having greater awareness within the system and then being able to automate a lot of the things that we do manually today. Um, and in a big way, what I think that's going to enable is um, having an understanding of when something goes wrong, what actually needs to be done to fix it, figuring that out automatically, and even potentially being able to dispatch someone to make those, take those corrective actions without any intervention from the user. So uh, a, a time when you could subscribe to a service, um, you pay a monthly fee, and then they monitor your system, um, your HVAC system, your lighting, all kinds of different systems in your home or your business, and essentially they just take care of it. And you get better energy performance because you have all of your equipment operating as designed. And they can also give you feedback to say, um, you know, you might want to think about um, replacing your refrigerator because newer models will perform 30% better and your utility offers this benefit. Click this button or tap this thing on your phone and the refrigerator will be delivered and installed for you. And it'll be rolled into your bill. It'll all be done taken care of automatically behind the scenes. You won't have to do anything to sort of realize those benefits. So can I, I ask, can you imagine a different future where um, a third party owns that refrigerator? Yes, or that, that could certainly be a part of it, where that's all part of that price that you're paying every month. So the, so the, so the service that I'm buying is refrigeration for food, yes. or someone else owns my furnace or right. my air conditioner, and then that, that operations and maintenance requirement is on the owner, and I'm paying for the service of heating or cooling or refrigeration. Fundamentally, that's, generally speaking, what building occupants want. They want heating, they want cooling, they want refrigeration, they want to be comfortable and satisfied and have the building meet their needs. They don't want to spend time looking up, well, who is the best, they don't want to go into Angie's list to figure out who is the best HVAC contractor in my area so I can call them, so I can schedule them, so I can be at home instead of at work, waiting for them to show up so they can show up late so I can spend way too much money um, on a fix to my HVAC system. They want that, ideally, to be something that's far more streamlined. and the infrastructure that we have in place so we can streamline something like uh, uh, movie streaming to your home, those same innovations can be applied to the energy system and get, to get people the same kind of benefits. So Ian, 25 years ago, I think you founded your company. Um, and, and so the company's called Tatum, and this is an acronym. Uh, it's technology as if the earth matters. So that expressed Ian's vision for what his company would. Do you know where it came from? I, it came from Small is Beautiful. It, it came from uh, the book. It was the same author. It, well, maybe it's a it's subtitle. A there you go. A subtitle to the book Small is Beautiful by E.F. Schumacher, who was uh, the founder of Intermediate Technology Development Group. So he was an alternative energy guy. And the subtitle of his book was Economics as if People Mattered. And so I just twisted that up. So over the, over the 25 years that you had the vision of a, of a company that, that would um, focus on technology as if the earth mattered. So how has the market moved over that period? Uh, the changes have been uh, phenomenal, almost, almost uh, mind-blowing, and it's primarily in the last 15 years. I think uh, the fir my first year, 10 years, was 1990s, was like wandering in the wilderness. Um, in the last 15 years, things really took off, and uh, everything has changed. Uh, the biggest ones for me are technology developments, um, LED lighting, which about five years ago, I was refusing to evaluate or specify because the products were so um, poor, unreliable, uh, and the uh, performance claims were, were, were by and large very exaggerated. And in the last five years, um, reliable, uh, persistent uh, LED lighting with good data has arrived. So LED lighting, solar, the drop in price of solar. I put in a solar system on my office building five years ago, it's $10 a watt. And today we're looking at like $2.50 a watt. Um, the, the drop in price of, uh, of solar PV 
um, it goes on and on. The uh, technology developments and then developments in the services, almost, almost lagging, but um, to make use of these technologies. It's uh, fabulous, fabulous. And, and, and we've got a long way to go. I mean, our work is cut out for us to reach uh, whatever, f 40 or 50 by 30 or 80 by uh, 50. Um, our work is cut out. We've got a lot of work to do, but um, we've come a long way. Well, I'm uh, happy to open the floor to questions. Are there other questions from the floor? Vince. This sounds like fun. <laughs> <laughs> 30 years ago, I, I mean, I can't believe it. I put gas in my car to get here. <laughs> As compared to teleporting down today, you know. <laughs> it's hard to believe, I'm telling you. Hydrogen fuel wasn't even uh, heavily marketed back then. <laughs> There's so many things that could be different 30 years from now, 40 years from now, if you think about it. The uh, intelligence that you have in every aspect of what runs your house, the smart glass that Corning developed, for example, I would have woken up this morning and I wouldn't have had to go to work because I am at work, I'm at home. It's one and the same. What, what's the difference? Why do I have to commute to some location to perform an intelligent mental function? I can do so at home. Um, common transportation might be not traveling at all, right? So transportation might be to get to the Adirondacks because I want to go enjoy life might be to go to the library. I uh, would hope to have, uh, what I've been alluding to with several people throughout the, the day as open source, unrestricted information, because I like doing research. I think that'd be open to everyone. We ought to share ideas with each other for the pure answer, because it's right. So, no questions, just a statement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had a quick question, and I will preface this question by saying I was one of the speakers this morning talking on combustion, so I'm much more on the power generation technology end. Um, and actually, a lot of the, the discussion this morning about the goals for 50% uh, motivated my talk very well, so thank you for, <laughs> for putting that in. But a lot of the goals that we've been talking about, especially on the power usage side, um, have been about New York State or the United States, the purview of the Department of Energy. And my question is, are we kicking the can down the road? Um, a lot of what we talk about in the gas turbine business is that China is buying enormous numbers of gas turbines. They're installing enormous number of coal plants because they're building all our stuff. And so as we retrofit our homes, as we improve um, our energy efficiency, has, do you guys have perspective on where that stuff is coming from and what the total life cycle cost is um, to making us and New York State more energy efficient by 2025? So, thanks. Um, so I think that there's a couple of parts to that. One is that I think that we can continue to work on making manufacturing more efficient. Um, so actually changing the way that we manufacture products, moving to materials that are easier to manufacture, um, lighter, so they're easier to transport, so that the, uh, on a life cycle basis, you have less emissions associated with, with transporting, delivering that product to the end customer. Um, so I think those are big areas of opportunity. Um, another area that I think is uh, very exciting is the, um, the sort of, I don't want to call it trickle down, because I think that's, that's a very weighted term, but this idea that the innovations that we develop for New York or the innovations that we develop for the US are not uh, restricted to the US market. So if we develop products that perform better, that use less energy, that are more efficient, um, there's nothing precluding those technologies from being adopted in other countries. Um, and that cuts both ways. Um, there may be other countries where um, economic conditions uh, with respect to energy are different such that the products that are appropriate for those markets, um, the development cycles and, and R&D effort that's uh, put forth in those countries can eventually reach US markets as well. Um, so uh, in sectors where, for example, in the building envelope, 
uh, if there are areas where energy prices are very high, and that it encourages adoption of more efficient building envelope products, those same products can eventually be adopted in the US market. And the sort of heavy lift in terms of the first cost for adoption has already been taken care of in those other places. Any other comments? First? Yeah, I was trying to figure out how to, how to work this pitch in. Um, National Grid has got a very robust economic development group, and part of what we're focusing on is how do we get some of the manufacturing in, inside the New York State? And the recent announcement with LEDs and DeWitt is part of it. Um, we've got a REV project in Buffalo, and it involves putting solar panels on um, uh, underserved, underprivileged areas. And it's not just, we're going to buy your solar panels and come and, and put them on people's roofs. It's some of the manufacturing is going to take place. Um, in that area. And if you go to um, our economic <laughs> development website, which is shovelready.com, Niagara Mohawk actually coined that term years ago, so we own that domain, under, <laughs> under grants. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people don't, don't know it. it. It was created right down the road here. But we have grants, and um, there's two of them for sustainable and, and energy efficiency. And for example, there's a lot of dairy industry taking off processing facilities. So we gave, um, uh, a wastewater treatment facility that was processing that, a half a million dollars to put a digester in and make electricity from that. So the pitch, which is kind of leading into, go to that site, and if you've got technologies or, or um, demonstration type projects, there is funding through National Grid, potentially for that type of thing. And again, the effort is, you know, not only can, can New York State be more efficient, but how can we develop the manufacturing and the technologies and keep it here, too. Hello, um, I'm an assistant professor at SUNY ESF, and we have a pretty unique major in sustainable energy management. Um, so this, I'm, I'm coming from engineering. Um, these students are not engineering students, but they want to make a difference in your field. What advice would you give to them so that um, they can be successful in that? In addition to you know the education that they're getting, their energy, science, and management, literate. Um, any skills or advice that you would give to them? I want to train them to, you know, be successful. Um, my my advice um, is is to get into buildings. Um, I, I continue, you know, after thirty years uh, of work in the field, I continue to learn virtually every time I step into a building. And so um, we have uh, firms like mine, and there's another you know, 50 ac across upstate doing energy audits. We go into buildings, and we, we climb into attics, and we get dirty. Um, but we learn something every time. So um, it's especially in, in, in the field of building science, just to, to get into buildings. Other, other advice? Um, I think the piece of advice I would give is, as much as possible, um, make sure your students have internship opportunities. I think that that's a really great opportunity to get sort of hands-on, on-the-ground experience. I um, mean, in particular, to get a better context for, or a better understanding of the applications of the things that they're learning in the classroom. Um, I think that that can really help sort of contextualize and, um, uh, help them understand the value of an application of what they're what they're actually learning in the classroom, um, and I think it also it gives them something to put on their resume. I mean, uh, it gives them something an uh, experience that they can point to as uh, professional development. So my question is for Chioke. I was going to ask it during the, the keynote, but um, you mentioned that the technology roadmaps influenced um, how the QTR was developed and that you continue to do those. So it sounds like if people are giving market input, um, the market people are giving input, that could influence the R&D agenda of the Department of Energy. So what, um, what roadmaps are you working on right now in building technologies, and um, how can people give their input into those? So there's a couple of different ways that that can work. Um, the roadmap that we're working on right now that I can think of off the top of my head is in the sensors and control space. So building sensors, building automation systems, um, 
that roadmap is nearing the end of its cycle, so it's closer to release than it is to initial development. <coughs> Um, generally speaking, when we do a roadmap, there's at least two different ways you can engage with us. One is that we typically do uh, some kind of workshop. Um, generally in DC, though not always, sometimes it's co-located with a conference in the relevant field. Um, and so we'll have, we'll convene people to talk through sort of major uh, R&D opportunities as well as defining the current baseline or current state of the art in that technology area. So that's one major way that you can interface and in the roadmap development process. And the other way is through a request for information, responding to requests for information. We generally release RFIs um, at some point during the roadmap development process. And anyone, in, uh, anyone really, uh, even people who are outside the United States, are welcome to respond. Um, whether And when you respond to an RFI, I think it's important to remember that uh, there's usually a lot of questions. You don't have to respond to all of them. If you only have expertise in one area of questions or even only one question, we welcome any response uh, at any level. Um, and on an office by office basis, at least, you can generally find out about when those RFIs are released by subscribing to the newsletter or email list of that office. So we, when we open an RFI, we send an email out to everyone who's subscribed to our email list to say, hey, this RFI is open until this date. Please respond. Uh, apply that, uh, that that question to National Grid. If you look, look to the future mm -hmm. in terms of technology roadmaps, and again, bring, bringing it back to the present, are there key technologies that you see a need for? Well, you kind of alluded to building management, and, and the first speaker this morning talked about, um, I think it was 54% of, of utilization of the grid. And I, um, I deal with a lot of customers, and when they're growing, they're only looking at their peak that they set for a very, very short period of time. And you know, I've been in this industry for a while, and 10 years ago, when more information was made available to customers, all of our customers, 250 kW and above, have access to their hour-by-hour -hour energy usage. So I figured by this point, there'd be a lot more as far as building automation, building management, that type of thing. Very little of it has taken place. And, um, that just very much surprised me. The, the, the price signals in the market are not encouraging customers to really take a close look at that. And um, I'm not sure how you're, gonna, how you're gonna change that. Some of it is the capacity on national grid system, because you have to look at that. But then you also have to look at the generation behind it, again, which we're not part of. Now they've gone kind of a step there. There's a, a thing called the capacity tag on customers' bills. So what they do is the ISO takes a look at what was the peak in New York State during the summertime? What was the most load on the system? And then for all customers that have a capacity tag, they capture that value for that hour, specific to them. And they then pay that over a 12-month period. It's kind of like a ratchet. So it's going to be interesting to see if that drives the market a bit. But there's an awful lot of opportunity in, in energy management systems and demand reduction. I'd like to respond to that a little bit because uh, we do that, you know. I called uh, National Grid and said, okay, how did you figure out our capacity tag? And we have a, uh, a demand software. So I can see every 15 minutes, you know, what we're doing. The problem, I think, is to some extent in manufacturing, we haven't changed our culture in how we allocate energy. Energy is overhead. So I can't go to the iron foundry and say, hey, you just cost me $6,000. Because there's no place for that supervisor to get a good boy by saving me $6,000. And in part, you know, we have that software, but again, you know, that software, it, Six months after you install it, it starts to become obsolete. Obsolete and obsolete, and we're going to have to change it again. But we have not yet put in the kind of data that we need to be able to say, all right, all of a sudden, why are my compressors running this high? Who's, who's running? Do I have a leak? What, what do I have? And I can't shut down a department. So I have incoming data, but not anywhere near enough, and not anywhere near enough analysis or economic analysis to be able to apply that to anything. So I sit there going, oh. Yeah. And in manufacturing, it's I don't, That's difficult. not a question, I'm sorry. <laughs> in, in manufacturing, it's very difficult. I mean, I deal mainly with institutional type customers, and 
um, years ago, 25 years ago, we had incentives for um, ice storage, thermal storage. And you know, you make ice at night and you offset your air conditioning load during the day. Um, the presentation I was at at lunch with, with another national grid person, ice storage was back on, on the table in, in these places. So yeah, but ma for manufacturing it's very difficult. So that's 25 years from now. It will be easy. <laughs> sure. Hi, uh, I have a question about hydrogen. Where do you see hydrogen in our future? Do you think it can become a common uh, medium for transport of energy? So Vince, Vince made hydrogen, put, put hydrogen in his car to teleport it. Oh, it's her earlier. <laughs> but thank sure. you. Yeah, but, yeah um, so I think that hydrogen uh, still poses uh, there, there's a huge opportunity in the hydrogen space, and there's still a lot of research that needs to be done as well. So uh, the, there, I think there's ongoing work on the fuel cell side for utilization um, and uh, making those fuel cells more efficient, but also bringing down costs um, and increasing durability uh, and cycle life. Uh, and there's, and there's also work um, on the very significant problem of hydrogen storage. Uh, simply because of the, not necessarily from a safety standpoint, but just from a density standpoint. Um, getting hydrogen to the density that you need for uh, mobile applications, I think is a, still an, a very active area of research and still a big pain point. Um, and then, of course, there is fundamentally, as I talked about a little bit or alluded to in my talk, there's the issue of infrastructure. Um, I wouldn't be at all surprised if we see regional adoption of hydrogen. Uh, before we see some sort of nationwide adoption. So we may see adoption, for example, in regions that are very sensitive to uh, emissions or where it's very easy or low cost to produce hydrogen. So you might see adoption, for example, in Texas and California before you see adoption in um, Montana, <coughs> let's say, um, where the infrastructure costs are gonna be very high because you have relatively low density of customers. Um, so I think it's gonna be probably a slow rollout, but um, there's definitely uh, still a lot of opportunities for the hydrogen play in a lot of different application areas. Other questions? Other answers? <laughs> I will just reiterate what I said earlier. The uh, opportunities are just endless. If anyone needs a research project, if anyone has grad students who need projects, just Drop me an email. I've, I've got a list longer than my arm. They, uh, um, um, so I wanted to talk about something that Ian and I had, had talked yeah, about earlier, please. Um, which is, uh, it's actually something I talked to some folks at NYSERDA about as well today, which is the issue of um, balance of system costs and installed costs for various technologies. Um, I think this is a significant, I know this is a significant pain point. Um, not just in solar, where uh, there's been a discussion about balance of system costs for a long time, but in a lot of technology areas where uh, there's a big gap between the cost of the technology or product itself and the cost to have that product in place uh, on site. Um, and that's particularly true in retrofit applications, which in the US is a significant portion of the market. So if you're talking about something like um, something where it, a drop in replacement isn't easy, so that could be something like a window. Uh, installing a retrofit window tends to be a very labor-intensive and time-consuming process. And so the costs associated with installing a window really dwarf the cost of the window itself, even a very high-performing, high-quality window, something that's R5 or R7 or something like that. So if we can find ways to address either through innovation in the product itself or innovation in the supply chain or changes in the labor requirements, um, if there are ways that we can bring down the installed costs. Um, I think that could have a really significant impact on a wide variety of uh, technologies. So you showed a graph in your uh, presentation at, at lunchtime uh, about the profound energy savings opportunities in buildings. And, and there were uh, five columns of costs broken down in a, in a variety of, uh, of areas, stock, um, 
uh, must be like code minimum. Yeah, it was minimum minimum building code. Minimum building code. Energy Star best available technology. Thermodynamic limit. Yes. And in each of those bar charts, there was a a gray bar at the bottom for other. Yes. And, and it was it was all the same all the way across. So this is kind of like a balance of system cost. What what's in the other, and why why was that not uh, available to to uh, th think about? Yeah. energy efficiency optimizations in other. So I'm glad you asked about that, <laughs> because I didn't mention it in the slide, but I'm glad someone noticed. Um, so other is all of the other things that are happening in a building that aren't characterized by the couple of categories that we had. So we had uh, various HVAC loads, so heating, cooling, ventilation, uh, water heating, refrigeration, uh, lighting. lighting, and uh, PCs and non-PC uh, office equipment. And then we have this big chunk that's other, which is all of the other things you can imagine. So it's escalators and elevators and various uh, delivery systems. It might be conveyor belts or um, uh, server equipment that's in a building or other building operation equipment. Uh, there's a huge range of um, fume hoods, uh, sterilization equipment. Uh, it's a huge range of all medical devices are in there, actually. Uh, for the commercial market, all like MRI machines, CAT scans, like, any medical device is all in there. So it's a huge range of different types of technologies. And that's a big reason why we didn't actually characterize it and break it down further, is because uh, if you uh, develop a new heat pump, that, that's more efficient, that's not going to affect escalators. And a technology that makes an escalator more efficient isn't going to make an elevator more efficient. And that isn't going to make an MRI machine more efficient. So a lot of those technologies, because they're so different in the way they work and in the particular building types that they're in, some of them are specific, like medical equipment, to only hospitals and medical clinics, outpatient clinics, hospitals. So for that reason, we didn't characterize that. Uh, we didn't break that up further. But there's something really interesting to note about that, which is that a lot of those uses, there's a lot of them, um, but a lot of them are um, devices that people don't normally think about when they think about energy use in a building. No one talks about the escalators in a building being a significant load or the elevators in a building. But when you start to pr improve the performance of the building envelope, of the HVAC system, the water heating, the other appliances, in a meaningful way, those things start to become a really big portion of your total load. And so that's really what is shown in that figure is that we have active R&D to improve the performance of these sort of big loads today, but those may not be the big loads 50 years from now. It may be uh, fume hoods for universities or escalators for uh, large commercial buildings or something like that. So um, just kind of, we left it on there because we could have just made it sort of disappear. Right. <laughs> we wanted to leave it on there to sort of highlight the fact that in the future, these loads that we now consider to be sort of in the noise may become very significant. So uh, another, another slide you showed was about the energy water nexus. So in, in you know, lo looking ahead to the future, so maybe this will, will also be um, uh, more acute in some regions of the, of the country. So can you talk about, you know, what, what is this, 30 years from now, will we be talking about, remember when we weren't wor worrying about water and the wa energy water nexus? Um, yeah, so. <laughs> The challenge of the energy water nexus is very different in different parts of the country. So if you talk to people in California or Texas, they'll start really wringing their hands about, oh my gosh, what are we gonna do about water? Our water resources are horribly depleted. We don't see that that's gonna change any time in the future. Um, on the other hand, if you talk to people in Michigan, they'll sort of tilt their head sideways and be like, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, why would we be concerned about that? So there's a big gap between sort of the states that are, or the areas that are most concerned about water, and those that are least concerned about water, just as a function of their water resource availability, and also, in a big way, how they use that water to deliver electric power. Um, in areas that are, uh, v have very water intensive electric power, or electric generation, the concern about water availability and water utilization and water quality start to really, uh, are starting to really come to the surface. And in areas where water is not as much of a player in their electricity system, it's less of a concern. So even in states like Washington, which have, uh, generally speaking, have very good uh, water resources, uh, because so much of their electricity generation depends on uh, hydro resources, 
it's still a major area of concern for them, um, even though that, that's not a place you would normally identify as, a, as an area that would be concerned about water availability. So to, to understand the chart that you showed, um, so it was like water sources and then uses. Mm -hmm. um, is all the water that's accounted for there consumed? Or so is it going out in like cooling towers? So particularly in thermo thermoelectric mm -hmm. generation. Um, if, if water is just being used as a heat sink right. and it's not right. being evaporated, does it count? So I believe in that figure. I believe that it only treats consumed water, but I'm not positive about that. Yeah, there was a lot of water going into thermoelectric. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm not totally yeah. <laughs> sure. Um, there's a whole long report that underlies that figure. So um, I don't want to say for sure that that's the case. Um, I do know that there's sort of two parts to that, that question about sort of consumption versus once they're cooling. Um, in some areas, consumption really matters. and you're. Uh, even though there's a lot less water being used, <coughs> used um, there's still a big concern with consumption. And moving to something like dry cooling or partial dry cooling is something that would really make a lot of sense. Um, there are other places where once through cooling is actually fine because of the water, particular nature of the water resources available to them. But in places that are hot, um, even if they have good water resources, very often in the summertime when they need that power most, those water resources are also hot. And so they may run into uh, discharge temperature limits um, where uh, they're going to end up incurring fines or penalties mm -hmm. associated with that. And so there may be environmental impacts associated with, um, with uh, once through cooling systems, even in places where the volume of water is completely sufficient. Okay. I'm going to put out a last call for any final questions from the folks who are gathered. Hearing none, I want to thank thank the panelists for your your time and your contributions. I want to thank thank you all for joining us at our fifteenth uh, annual symposium, and in, invite everyone uh, to join us out in the library at the Crown, Crown Plaza across across the way. We'll uh, have a, uh, a a no host reception, so bring 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 your. Bring yourselves and, uh, and, and join us. So thanks, thanks again.